uh, microphone is uh, left it is always off because if you turn on your microphone and we hear you then the image turns from uh, Lindy's lecture to your own uh, image so um hold on just a second I would like to welcome Lindy instead of uh, at the archaeological research unit to this uh, Zoom online event. Um, many of you know Lindy very well, but I would like to say a few words uh, for those of you who have not had the chance to meet her. Dr. Crew moved to Cyprus in the summer of 2017 to take up the position of the director of the Cyprus American Archaeological Research Institute. But her relation to the island goes back in time as she was introduced to Cypriot archaeology already since her undergraduate studies at La Trobe University in Melbourne. She is a native Australian, where she was taught by David Frankel and Jenny Webb. Having completed her first degree, Lindy moved to the University of Edinburgh for her graduate studies under the supervision of the late Professor Edgar Peltenberg. She became an integral part of the University of Edinburgh team and worked with them in the excavations of the Calcolithic sites in the Pathos region. But her doctoral research centered on the introduction of the fast potter's wheel on the late Bronze Age Cyprus, with particular reference to the town of Encomi. When she completed her PhD, Dr. Crew took up a position at the British Museum to publish online the Encomi material and to build up the database, which so many of us have been using ever since. And of course, this has been extended by, um, by uh, Thomas Kiley uh, to other sites as well. She left the British Museum to take up the post of British Academy Reckitt Postdoctoral Fellow in Archaeology at Manchester, investigating Levantine Cypriot connections at the end of the Middle Bronze Age. She then held a 50% position at the Manchester Museum and 50% lecture position at the University of Manchester, and from 2013 to 2017, she worked full time as lecturer at the same university. She was thus one of the few archaeologists in Britain who still taught Cypriot archaeology and supervised two PhD students who worked on a Cypriot subject. In 2017, she was elected to the position of director of CARI. As the director of CARI, she has worked closely with the Department of Antiquities the Archaeological Research Unit and Star Sea of the Cyprus Institute on various joint projects such as conferences, workshops, and summer schools. She has always been actively involved in field work, and in 2001, she took over the role of field director of Edgar Peltenberg's excavations at the Necropolis of Suskiu Laona. Since 2007, she has been directing her own excavations at the early Middle Bronze Age settlement of Kisone Raskaya in the southwest of Cyprus. This period is almost completely unknown in this region of the island, and the project hopes to investigate local responses and regional differences, similarities to settlements in other parts of the island, as well as settlement shift and structural change through time. Apart from numerous papers published in peer-reviewed journals and conference proceedings, Dr. Crew has published two monographs, one on Bronze Age spindle worlds and one on the early phases of Encomi, which many of us have used extensively. In 2019, she completed together with Diane Bolger, the publication of the excavations of Laona that Edgar Peltenberg was working on until the end of his life. The book entitled Figurine Makers of Prehistoric Cyprus, Settlement and Cemeteries at Suskiu was published in 2019. And it is really a wonderful publication. If you haven't seen it, I urge you to look at it. And it is of also a, a wonderful collaborative work. I'm not saying it because I was one of the authors there, but um, really do have a look at the book. Furthermore, together with Linda Hewlin and Jenny Webb, she co-edited a volume in honor of Alison South that was published in 2018. Lindy Cruz's research interests lie in all aspects of the Eastern Mediterranean, but particularly the Bronze Age of Cyprus, She's interested in archaeological ceramics as correlates of material identity, the mechanisms of social transformations, as well as the relationship between material culture and social identity. Lind is also researching effectively communicating prehistoric archaeology through museum display and outreach. And of course, she has done this a lot here in Cyprus, 
Um, the two main examples are the uh, large roundhouse at the Sonera Mosfilia, and the other, of course, is uh, the work she has done on prehistoric beer, uh, about which she has spoken to us uh, sometime in the past. This evening's lecture, uh, for this evening, she will deliver a lecture entitled The Changing Nature of Occupation at Bronze Age Kisonerga Scalia. So welcome, Lindy. I will now mute my, tele my microphone. I ask everybody else to mute their own. Uh, there is a hand up. Does somebody? No. Okay. No, it was my cursor. So um, welcome, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lina for that um, lovely introduction. And I, everyone can hear me okay, I hope. And I'm really delighted to be able to participate in the online lecture series for the unit this semester. So today I will first of all share my screen. And I hope that that is visible to everyone right now. PowerPoint presentation. And it's everyone fine. can hear me? Yeah, yes, good. we can hear you. We can see the presentation. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. So today I am going to discuss the occupation sequences and the nature of occupation at Casonaga Scalia. And you can see here from this map that's up on the screen that most excavated settlements of the early Middle Bronze Age are one or two period sites, and there are very few sites that span multiple relative chronological periods. Marquis in the center of the island here is an exception, and that was occupied from the Filia, abandoned early in the period. Kasonaga, as you can see out west, has a multitude of periods attested, but this, of course, is not the full picture of the island, and we have definitely missing some information. As you can see in the northern parts of the island, it was an early archaeological focus on cemeteries. Post-1974, archaeologists have shown more interest in settlements, but our coverage is certainly still patchy and we have a lot more work to do. And particularly, we have this enigmatic so-called filiar phase. The heartland of the filiar is held to be up in this area, after the type site of Filia, and these sites have not been excavated for many years. It marks the start of the Bronze Age, but it also overlaps to some extent with the end of the Chalcolithic. It's characterized by a distinctive material culture that appears to be uniform across the island and is indicative of transformations in all ways of life. From house forms, cooking techniques, textile production, animal resources, and copper technologies. These changes are widely held to be connected to the Anatolian Early Bronze Age, but the exact mechanisms and indeed time span are still debated. But we're talking about maybe two to three centuries around 2005. So to sum up briefly prehistoric occupation in Kasonaga village, we have from the localities of Maluskia and also Mosfilia, some early Neolithic, pre-pottery Neolithic B deposits, and Mosfilia itself, the Calcolithic primarily site excavated by Eddie Peltenberg, has the longest prehistoric occupation sequence on the island. We then get some settlement drift or shift just down the hill, as you'll see, to Kasonaga Scalia by the Filiar period, or perhaps during the late Calcolithic. Then from the Filiar to early Middle Cypriot periods, we have occupation that it seems to be domestic in nature, a series of Bronze Age rectilinear multi-roomed structures. But it's during the transition from the middle to the late Bronze Age that we see a large scale building program. And this is a very short lived phase. The site is abandoned altogether around about 1600 BC. And as Kisonaga is the first site to be excavated of this period in the West, we're retrieving this really distinct local material culture that has not previously been seen in any quantity. I'm not going to talk about the Neolithic wells today, but I think I would like to remind the audience that these, along with those at Chilorocambos and submerged off the coast of Israel, are the earliest water wells in the world. They're immensely important features. They're up to eight meters deep, 
somehow strategically positioned exactly over subterranean streams. You can see Paul Croft here in this picture, who's excavated many of the wells, demonstrating how the handholds and footholds work to get in and out of them. And they're filled with a range of debris, tools, faunal and floral remains, and items like this fragmentary chalk vessel and other artifacts. And it's not just along the coastal area that we have this very early occupation. This fragmentary shaft straightener, which by the incised decoration has its closest parallel at Ayavavara in the center of the island, should be transitional to the pre-pottery Neolithic A and the pre-pottery Neolithic B perhaps. So we know we have this early occupation occurring in all areas of the village boundaries. We also get occasional vessel fragments and obsidian blades in the later deposits. So coming to the area of Kasonaga, you can see here outlined in the red square, the area where I've been focusing my excavations. In the yellow rectangle is the roofed area preserved open for visitors of Kasonaga Mosfilia. Up here and further north off the map are the areas of the Neolithic wells. And we're sandwiched here between the village and the development of tourism on the coast road. And whilst we recognize that the needs of present day communities must also be met, it's vital that we continue to do what we can in cooperation with the people of Kasonaga and with the Department of Antiquities of Cyprus to record as much of this finite and valuable resource as possible. These ephemeral remains require special care and should be a source of pride and indeed a way of attracting different types of tourism to the inhabitants of the modern village. This 1963 aerial photo perhaps gives us more of an idea of the prehistoric landscape. And you can, in 1973 to 1974, the agricultural fields of the village underwent a program of machine terracing for land consolidation. And it was at that point a lot of these sites were exposed. Sophocles Hadjisavas, who undertook the survey in the mid 70s in the area, noted that the area of Kasonaga Mosfilia and Kasonaga Scalia took a greater area than the modern village. So it's a really important landscape, an interesting landscape. We have these two streams now dry, the Scotinus to the north, certainly perennial during prehistory, the smaller unnamed stream to the south may or may not have been perennial. And we see Scalia is located on a gentle rise leading down to the sea, which is only 500 meters away. And this again is quite unusual for the early Middle Bronze Age, where most sites are located at least five kilometers inland, at least as far as we know. Here, down at the coast, there are two small inlets that it would have been possible to draw small boats into, but the sea around here is notoriously rough. There are no large harbors, and we know that there is a late Roman warehouse on the cliffs just above this inlet but certainly it's not a great place for major seafaring. Here again, you can see the three plots outlined in yellow where I have excavated and demonstrated that our in situ Bronze Age remains preserved, where we have surveyed, covers an area of 10 hectares of material. But again, because of this early machine terracing, it's difficult to know without excavation, whether this is dispersed soils from other archaeological areas, or whether it's in situ. So this is the plot where my energies have been focused, thanks to the very kind permission of the landowners, the Nicola family, who allow me to excavate here. And here is Mosfilia before the roof went on. And if we take a look at the plan published by Eddie Peltenberg in the Kasonaga Mosfilia publication, we can see the outline of the Calcolithic site of Mosfilia in relation to the Bronze Age site of Scalia. And there's this very unusual dip, which is surely not the accurate extent of the site. And we have discovered, as we've been excavating here, an area of Calcolithic pit graves. Here in this northern part of the plot, we have lost the Bronze Age occupation and we are down through into the Calcolithic. So these Calcolithic pit graves, of which we've now excavated five and doubtless there would be many more in this area. There are no grave goods. 
They are typical calcolithic pit grave shapes, some with capstones, as you can see on the right, others just shallow pits. There are no grave goods, as I mentioned, but from sherds in the fill, they are certainly no earlier than the middle calcolithic and most probably date to this phase. Our physical anthropologist, Michelle Gamble, has studied the remains. This burial you can see on the left-hand side is an adult female who was buried with a very tight bundle of two adolescents, which Michelle thinks were placed inside a bag. So we have adult females and subadults, and this fits with the pattern of what we know at the settlement. But this is very interesting that Kasonogamos Filia was supposed to be intramural burial, and here we apparently have an off-site burial area, as there is no evidence for any structures associated with this. Before I move to talk about the late the Bronze Age remains at the site, I would like to talk a little bit more about the late Calcolithic and the Filia relationships. So we do know that Filia material culture appears during the late Calcolithic period at Kasonogamos Filia and then more frequently in the final phase, again in the plow zone at the site of the filiar. So at least in this red polished filiar ware that you can see in these two vessels here, we certainly have evidence for connect. New evidence will be shortly forthcoming. Raphael Lautari and I, university student, PhD student from the University of Cambridge, are working currently on publishing some of Dikios's unpublished tomb material material from Filiar, and there are certainly some late Calcolithic vessels in the tombs at Filiar, which is incredibly exciting and might also assist us with understanding these interactions. On the left is the red and black stroke burnished pottery, which appears in the late Calcolithic, and although these two vessel types look different, they're functionally similar. similar. It's really about emphasis this on pouring, you can see these elaborated pouring spouts in these serving vessels, and on individual eating and drinking bowls. These new styles are really indicative of new ways of sharing, consuming food and drink, and quite probably alcoholic beverages. So the different but shiny red lustrous pottery involved in pouring and serving and consuming is something that is common to both. So we don't really know a great deal about the processes or the timing or indeed any possible regional differences or how the early Cypriot period, particularly in the West, relates to this late Calcolithic to Filia to Bronze Age phenomenon. And the Southwest has been considered marginal to these processes. We know that the Filia heartland is in the Northwest of the island, but at Kasonaga, we also know that there is a small copper outcrop in the vicinity. And if it's possible that early Anatolian explorers or early Cypriot coppersmiths were looking for sources, it may have appeared that Kasonaga was more viable or had greater accessibility than was first thought. And it may have only become apparent later that through the Ofgos Rally was a more viable route, and therefore that became the locus of filial activity. At Kasonaga, we also have problems of very compressed stratigraphy, as I will show you, making some of these questions currently different to disentangle, but we remain optimistic for the future. So coming now to show you some of our earliest deposits that we've retrieved so far, located in three areas of the site, up in the north in G2 and B3, they are immediately beneath and disturbed by this so-called final phase complex that I will speak about later in the talk. In area D, down in the south, we have a longer stratified sequence from the filia to around middle Cypriot two with a series of five floors. This stone built structure that you see dates to the final phase complex. I'll return to that later. But what I want to point out is you can see to the right, this wavy line is a mud plaster curb which was filled with a deposit of pure calcolithic and earlier pottery. These pits that you can see here are part of a ground surface with an extensive pitscape and all of these pits seem to be containing filia and EC1-2 material. So there again is no architecture in this area but there are 
three areas that seem to relate to the late Calcolithic, the Filia, and the early Cypriot. So how does this material appear? We have true imports of Filia material made in the Northwest, as Maria de Comitu's research showed. And this lustrous red polished filia with this characteristic herringbone design. We have black slip and combed, as it's known, again, imported from the Northwest. White painted filia, which is also from the Northwest. Cooking pots of various types, some local, some apparently imports. And at Mosfilia, they had black slip and combed and red polished filia, but not these additional wares and certainly not these imitation wares that you can see. Local non-calcareous clays with band burnishing, local versions of black slip and combed, and this very pale surface that is the forerunner of the drab polished ware. Again, these thick, quite coarse clay vessels, but with incised decoration. And this continues through into the early Cypriot where we see a mix of local production stylistically copying styles known elsewhere, as well as true imports. And you can see typological developments such as the tulip bowl that you see here, which is an EC development made again in this local early drab polished fabric. You can see an imported North Coast bowl, black top, red polished. We have brown polished. Again, local drab polished variants of South Coast red polished, pithoi, local black top bottles and then imported mottled ware as well. This is particularly interesting. This is what you would consider to be a late Calcolithic shirt if you didn't see the form being something that belongs in the Bronze Age. And again, these kind of developments as well. So it is very dynamic and very interactive and certainly the local potters at Kasonaga are picking up on these new styles and replicating them and Basically, they're sitting alongside the imported materials. Coming to our best preserved evidence in area D, where we have an architectural array, sadly scarred by pits, as you can see, but the pale gray pits belong to, are sealed by the floor above these. The darker gray pits belong to one or two floors above. So it's all fairly secure, at least. Very neatly built rectilinear walls. They're very thin, thinner than the later ECMC walls. They're only about 50 centimeters instead of 70 to 80 centimeters wide. Very fine plastered floors, which we also don't see later and fine built plaster features such as this bench. And retrieved from some of the higher deposits are characteristic filiar objects such as the annular pendant you see in the top right and made of picrolite, and then this probable labrette, which is a unique object, but is for placing in a piercing of an ear or a lip. And as it's made of picrolite, and this material goes out of use after this time, it is almost certainly Villar. And we also know that they had labrettes in early Bronze Age Anatolia. Again, in here, we're seeing the same interplay. We have an imported from the Northwest, Filia red slip neck juglet, which you can see was built into the wall right here, and a locally produced imitation of the same found in this pit over here. Again, in the top, Northwestern imported spindle wells of filia date, and at the bottom, our local variants manufactured to fit in with this style. Again, moving slightly forward into the early Cypriot one to two, this continues for us. We have local variants, local production, and then some imports such as this red polished one to two ear lug pot found in the pit in the below left. And these two spindle wells, which are clear imports from the North Coast to the West. The latest attempt we've made to try and find some better preserved evidence of the early occupation is in B3 in the center of the site. In 2018, we sunk trench in the wide open area and we came straight down onto a truncated early Cypriot floor. So I'll come back to this later, but the final phase complex constructors were also messing with these early materials. 
This is a pot emplacement or a built-in mortar lined with pot sherds. The floor that was associated this, with this is missing. It should be slightly higher. This rim should abut over a floor. But inside this, we found this very interesting worked shell, which seems to be a spoon end, quite possibly with a wooden handle. And this local spindle well of an early type, which is again, locally produced. We extended this in 2019 and the plan certainly was for this season, which sadly didn't go ahead, to be able to extend further. And apologies for any dog scratching noises that you can hear in the background. Hopefully she'll keep quiet. Here you can see we have this wall, which extends through and this earlier wall, which abuts it and underlies it. And this wall was protruding above the final phase floors. And we've in fact now come down to the base of it. Here we have a very poorly preserved infant burial, which may have dated to higher up, but may have been deposited at this level and the base of this emplacement that we saw, as well as these two walls and a range of small finds, as well as the pottery. Again, spindle wells referencing North Coast styles, as well as locally produced ones referencing the Villiers. These two chalk discs that you can see here, which are now convincingly argued by a recently submitted PhD, Julia Muti, to have been precursors to the terracotta spindle worlds, appearing at the end of the middle Calcolithic and in use until the late Calcolithic, they predate the terracotta items and could function as viable spindle worlds. We also have collected a fine array of groundstone tools from these early deposits. This ax that you can see along the chisel in the bottom, and again, another recently submitted PhD, Ellen Suter, has done her work on the groundstone and shown that at Kasonaga, they're using, reusing a lot of Calcolithic stone tools in the Bronze Age. There are also some distinctive types, and particularly these chisels are certainly only of Calcolithic date. Again, just another example of one of these early features, a little bit more difficult to date, but this large mud plaster circular in or some sort of feature with this double outer ring that the MC3 people have hatched at the top off to get it down level with their trampled earth floors, but the remainder has been buried underneath these deposits. Again, it's not very well smoothed over and there must have been a lot of stubbing of toes going on in the final phase at Cusaponaga Scalia with protruding wall remnants and features from earlier occupation sticking up above the floor. So following the earlier EC1 to 2 material, we do have in area D, as I mentioned, a long sequence of five floors with what we recognize elsewhere as typical EC MC occupation. We have again these plaster or mud plaster or plaster mixed with pebble emplacements or inbuilt mortars. There is this plaster central post pad and post support. This was a circular pit hearth, which perhaps has some affinities at the site of Alhambra, but other features we seem to find at other sites, stone wall foundations, which would have had a mud brick superstructure. Again, most of the pottery that comes from this area is sort of utilitarian, large jugs, smaller jugs, this nice ladle handle, a range of ground stone tools. Our two copper fish hooks come from this area. And these are known from this period. And then occasionally to be able to situate ourselves in relative dating, red polished three manufactured from elsewhere on the island. And some local habits such as these little stone nests to rest juglets or juglets built into the rubble, which was forming the base of mud benches or features. And there is a pipos embedded upright on the outside of this wall as well. So these walls are not all contemporaneous with this exact period. There are different phases going on, which we have yet to disentangle, and there is some more work to be done in here as well. So coming now to the final phase complex. We can see here that it is indeed an ambitious 
and ambitious leveling and construction program that cut through a lot of earlier occupation and does seem to be initially with a big plan in mind. So the aim was apparently to create a very large open space that you can see here and to have these sort of workshop areas here that I'll come to in a moment, somehow related to this large curvilinear wall, which is about 1.2 meters wide at the base. We have traces of mud brick superstructure on top. And there is this very nicely plastered entranceway here. We do not really know whether this is an interior or this is an interior. There is apparently no enclosing aspect to this wall. It ends abruptly in open space here, and there are all these sort of openings and closings. There's no way you could call it a fortification wall, for example. So we are contending with disturbance from the Bronze Ages destroying the earlier deposits, and then the recent land consolidation programs, which are disturbing these later floors as well. And the function of this open space is quite unclear because there's very little material in the middle. I'll show you later, there is more accumulated around the edges and within the rectilinear aspects, but it is a very large open space, perhaps for gathering, perhaps for keeping animals. It's currently not clear. But in order to create this, they went to an awful lot of trouble. And in the north, as we've seen already with area G2, they truncated all the way down to late Capolithic to filial levels to extend an open platform for building. And here you can see this land consolidation or recent plowing, which is scratching our final place floors, but we're very lucky to have these as well preserved as they are. And of course, the large amounts of calcolithic material that we do find in these deposits may not all be related to underlying occupation because we can consider that the occupants of Casonica Scalia would have readily spotted a very convenient resource for collecting material to make their mud bricks at the collapsed debris from Casonica Mosfilia. It's also possible they are reusing older walls to repurpose them, and that might explain some of the strange angles and some of the less than straight walls we see around here, and particularly here. In the south, the opposite occurred, and they seem to have dumped a lot of fill and a lot of rubble to extend their horizontal building platform out into the area of the stream bed. At some point during the life of this building, they seem to have realized that they had a problem with water runoff going over their floors and constructed what we're interpreting as a series of sump or sink pits, where, and this is one, a modern one from the back of Kari. You dig a pit, fill it full of stones, and then when the water comes in, it will run down amongst the stones and not sit around on the surfaces. And these are located conveniently in the upslope area of the site. So this is perhaps a reasonable explanation for these. But in the 2019 season, removing a balk that had been there for quite some time, we've come upon another section of this snaky wall. And you can see here perhaps that it's not well joined. These are in fact two different cuts, but it does seem to curve around and it does abut this ECMC wall, which underlies this final phase con construct. And it is perhaps making a light, little bit more sense that we can see that this and this are parallel. Possibly we're starting to feel a little bit more contained and enclosed in this space, but it also possibly may have had a drainage function as well. So this industrial feature in area G2 that you can see in the north here, which is certainly not very well built, a single row of stones, only three courses high and filled with ashy debris, plaster, very little in the way of pottery or animal bone, but filled full of debris. And as we excavated it, we found located next to the entranceway, a pithos in situ, again, partially damaged by plowing. And on the interior, this vessel was located near the base. Both of these vessels are very exciting. They are, in fact, again, it's a local production using local clay and related to the drab polished ware, 
but imitating the so-called plain white handmade and plain white wheel-made wares. This wheel-made vessel is a very poor attempt to make a copy of a so-called Canaanite jar. You can see here the handle has not been stuck on terribly well, it's come off. It is turned on the wheel and it's been so heavily made that they've had to attach a string around here to try and support it to stop it from further collapsing as it was drying. But nonetheless, it is a very special vessel and does represent some of the earliest wheel-made pottery on Cyprus. The plain white handmade pithoi, on the other hand, are very elegant vessels with these characteristic finely done relief bands, rolled rims and flanged bases. And you can see some of this very fine relief from a shirt of another vessel. And here is a shirt from Enkmi. Stylistically, this is so similar across the island that it's very tempting to think about itinerant potters being involved in the production of these vessels. From the construction phase of this feature, it's a very fine mud plaster, plaster concave base, with which you can see this quite scrappy walls. But as it was cleared out and as we were coming down to the base of it, we found deposited on the base this very lovely zoomorphic figurine. He seems to be an oxen. It's been tethered for work. It has perhaps this is musculature on its back. But importantly, the horns, the feet, the tail have all been deliberately smashed off before it was deposited. And we can perhaps think about it as being killed. And as this is a very large structure, which was used for burning something on a very large scale, it is also tempting to theorize that it might have been for roasting whole oxen. And here you can see one characteristic of the very last occupation at the site before final abandonment. All these grandly constructed features, which had aims of doing things on a large scale, become reduced in their scope and reduced in their use. The pithos is placed at the entrance. This is filled nearly with debris. There's just a small pit cut for doing whatever heat related activities there were. There's a post support obscuring the center of it. It seems that just before people leave, activities do really downscale. So our best preserved evidence comes from within these two walls because we were fortunate that the walls did collapse in on themselves and the stone walls on both sides came in really nicely preserving the material underneath, including whole vessels like this cooking pot that you see here. As we've cleared inside this area, we have found yet another pithos located here. And this is another one of the plain white type. You can make out this very neat relief band and the pale surface again. And we also have some more large scale burning activities and more industrial activity, more processing of some materials that involves quite extensive fire, as you can see from this quite dragged ashy deposits. Located here was this bowl, which had been placed in position on the ground at the end of this large grinding stone. And as it was in the ground, it was smashed. This sherd was taken away. So presumably they're processing something into the bowl, which then had to partially drain. So perhaps something liquid based or something that they could conveniently collect, but they wanted some of it to run off. And now after the 29 season, it's even more interesting. We seem to have what could be interpreted as two workspaces. And again, more pot spreads. But you can see here, there are two of these large grinding stones, two mirrored flat slabs of working space and two post holes filled with burnt debris. So this appears to have been a workstation involving two people at least undertaking the same task. And you'll notice I can't really readily tell you what these tasks may have been because we have very little evidence preserved. Down in the area of B2, we have found that the courtyard that we I will show you in one moment has continued around from where we had, this is our beer making facility that I'm not going to be talking about today. But you can see here our drying kiln, which we interpret as for drying malted grain and also for probably curing meats and preserving fruit. 
a series of inbuilt mortars and grinding installations, cooking pots, and a number of groundstone tools and other objects. So now this is an L-shaped courtyard. And again, a large area of ashy deposits appearing here and here. You can perhaps make out this almost in situ quern with the rubber lying on its side. So again, the processing of materials going on in here. And immediately to the north in B2, this is the only area where we have something slightly different going on. And here we have this very rich deposit of fineware pottery, animal bones, and including these two complete sets of deer antlers still attached to the frontal part of the skull. Fineware such as this very elegant juglet, which you can see the handle is freshly broken. And again, we're so lucky just the tip of a bulldozer or a plow took the handle and left the rest of the deposit intact. On the exterior of this wall, a complete wild boar mandible was found. Quite likely this was suspended from the wall as a display piece. On the interior of this room, which we see is lined with benches, perhaps for sitting and enjoying the beers made in the courtyard next door, this pit was dug in association with the construction of this room and the building of the walls and benches containing at least five adult cattle crania and one partial crania of a small mammal. And they're not complete. They seem to have been worked, but the preservation is quite poor and it's sadly not difficult to see how they were worked. If they were worked into masks would be fascinating. But it is very tempting to see this pit deposited with these very special cattle crania as some sort of foundation deposit. But as they are so rare on Cyprus in the Bronze Age, and this predates other known ones as far as we know, it is very difficult to be certain. We have a lot of evidence for marine exploitation in the form of shells for both consumption and decoration. We do have two fish hooks, but we only really have one or two fish bones. So we're not able to retrieve the evidence of fish consumption, but they certainly do seem to have been eating shellfish and also making them into these, what well, seem to be a Casona Gascalia local bead style. We find lots of these pierced limpets with two or three or four or five holes pierced around the edge, presumably for fixing onto a garment. And for copper, in terms of the evidence that we have for copper, it is not a great deal. We do have the fish hooks. We have the kinds of objects that might get lost in settlements, such as needles and pins, the end of a tang from a hook tang weapon, which is presumably being held onto for re-smelting, and this small ingot fragment here. So what were they doing in this space? We know we have some objects retrieved from the middle of the areas. This fragmentary axe, which again is only partial. We found this in association with the final phase floor. Also this whetstone that you can see here. But now that we have gone below that level and have found these very early deposits, it is of course quite possible that it is an early 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 problem. Can people hear me? Yes, Lini, now we can hear you. For some reason, I'm just going to end the show and see if I can... Lindy, we could hear you oh, at the really? last point. Okay. We, we, could, we, can, we could hear you, All yes, right. and no, go back. Zoom, for some reason, decided to tell me the microphone did not want to work. Share your screen now so we can see the PowerPoint. Okay, we seem to just be having a slight technical hitch. I will try this.
We can see your screen now. Okay, let's hope this is all good. And yes, we can see the PowerPoint. Thank you. For some reason. So we have here and here and our axe. You can notice that it's quite interesting that our two excavated fire related features are facing both with the opening to the south, presumably to take advantage of prevailing winds or to protect from prevailing winds for whatever the function of these is. It is a very large open space. We do not really know what they were doing, but we do see that this has taken some initial organization and planning, even though towards the end, it seems to be a bit more haphazard. If we turn to the final phase pottery, we'll see that there are some more interesting things going on. We start to see new pottery styles appearing with links to elsewhere on the island, and we see a change from a light finish in our red polished and drab polished to a dark finish in terms of black slips and thinking about that this is in fact on the cusp of base ringware, which Christine Johnson of the Western Washington University is about to investigate in relation to the Sonega Scalia material, there is something going on which is reflected island wide. Red polished ware is absolutely found at many other sites of this period, and it is a characteristic of the later MC. These large numbers of mended vessels and particularly bowls, you can perhaps see here, these two bowls with mend holes. This seems to have been a feature of, again, just before abandonment, perhaps as people slowly moved away and left the site, we see that the potters have left and people might have to make do. And here we can see some more examples of local imitations of these new styles. The Kasonaga potters just keep going with their dynamism. We see here local black slip reserve slip, local imitations of the red polish of the red polished four, and rare white painted imports, white painted five and six from elsewhere. And just to show you that there are activities going on just on the inside and the outside of the snaky wall. Presumably, we've got some sort of light shelter set up here that's enabling people to take advantage of that while they work. As in line with other sites of the period, we do have figurative evidence. Our fra fragmentary protons or figurines tend to be decorated in the style that the pottery is decorated in, particularly these impressed circles, lines, framing dotted lines, and these are occurring quite frequently. But again, we have evidence from the final phase that these new figurine styles appear. You can see this one is legs, with these knees and the feet. This one is a female torso. And these are paralleled only by some unprovenanced examples from the Severus collection, but clearly made in the plain white wheel handmade wear. So Eastern Cypriot inspiration. So, we have a long sequence and we have varying changes in degrees of orientation. We see the filiar connections are with the Ovgos Valley very strongly. In the EC, we also start to see south coast connections in terms of the south coast red polished and other wares. In the EC, we also begin to see these clear north coast connections, particularly with from what we know of sites around there, such as the noose. In the final phase, again, we're seeing connections that go with the northwest, up to the area of Tumba Tuscuru, perhaps, where we know there's red polished connections in some of these sites. And again, down to the south, Palais Pathos is being founded at this time as well. And there are parallels with some of the pottery around the Episcopi and Arimi sites as well. We also seem to have, if not actual imported materials, then certainly ideas coming from the East and the Carpas in terms of the plain white, wheel-made pottery, the pithoi, and the figurine type. In any case, it's... It... In, uh, we have one qu question. Uh, and then, Kosti Chef, would you like to unmute your telephone? Uh, no, you don't have it. Do you have a question? Yes. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, I, I would like to say thank you, uh, Linda, for uh, an amazing uh, lecture. Actually, I came here a little uh, a little late, so maybe you talked about it. So in this case, sorry. But how did you originally find this place? At this uh, site? The site, well, the site was known from really, I mean, it was known there was Bronze Age there from the 1950s. And then when Sophocles Hadjisavis did the survey in the 1970s, it was more apparently what was going on. And then Eddie Peltenberg's, his team surveyed it in the 1980s and I myself surveyed it in 1999. <laughs> so it's had a fair bit of survey going on. And um, there are, you know, we all know there's a lot of really interesting sites out there. And I feel very fortunate that I was given permission to excavate this one. Yeah, okay, thank you. Lindy, there is a question about the beer. I'm interested in the evidence for beer. Any evidence for honey fermented beverages? Um, I wish, I mean, we have, there's something that's strange and kind of inexplicable is the number of juglets that we have in the settlement deposits. And that's not necessarily a typical thing because normally jug, juglets are more common in cemeteries. So we sort of have a theory that perhaps the juglets are containing something that is either a very precious yeast mix that they know is reliable or a sweetener for the beer or perhaps something that could be related to honey indeed. But I don't know, we'd be pretty lucky to find evidence that would be able to say one way or another for honey, unless you know of a way that we could. Anyway, I'd be happy to hear if there was a way of identifying honey. Thank you. There is another uh, question. Do you have any comments regarding maritime navigation in the early phases? Has any work been done with coastal reconstruction? This is by Bridget Clark. Um, various people have done underwater surveys and we actually had a small team helping us a few years ago trying to do an underwater survey again. The seabed is terribly rough um, around there, as Stella Domestica also knows. Um, there are Roman sherds around, there are Bronze Age sherds on the shore. It's, I think that everyone agrees it's a little bit too churned up around there exactly to have much luck with. But in terms of the coastline itself, we do know that it hasn't changed much indeed since the Neolithic because it's, it's cliffs around there. And so the sea level rises do not really make any difference to the coastline around Kasonga. Thank you. The, uh, there's a question by Rania Kuka. Um, she says there are remarkably a lot of industrial activities in the area of this curious wall. Taking in account the topography of the site, could this have been a retaining wall? Do you think that these are activities were taking place close to the limitation of the site? Well, initially we thought perhaps it was a retaining wall because it is so illogical and it's, um, I mean, it's this massive trench that they've dug a foundation trench about 50 centimeters deep and they've just dumped rubble and they've built superstructure on it. But the surface on both sides, I mean, there is definitely occupation activities contemporaneous on both sides of the wall. So it's not logical. I mean, it's really not logical. I mean, the only thing you can think of is given our proximity to the coast, that it is monumental. And so if you've got something that's potentially going to be built up very tall because it's got such a wide foundation, then any ships that are passing are going to be able to spot that there are some important people sitting up there on that hill. So rather than as a statement, I don't know. <laughs> it gets more and more mysterious. Yeah, you, you have the weirdest architecture in any site of Cyprus, I have to say. Uh, there is a question regarding from, uh, um, from Sophocles Sophocleus. Is there any evidence for the flora of the area by that time? Um, we certainly we do archaeobotanical studies on every intact context we get. So we do float everything and we've been obtaining as many seeds and as much evidence of the environment as we can. I mean, we have the standard 
sort of you know lentils and barley and wheat and commonly there's a lot more like Leilani Lucas who is our archaeobotanist has she found a lot of weed seeds and they're the kind of weeds that grow in agricultural fields so sort of eaten by the cattle for, for fodder and they're then showing up in the settlement that way so it's basically what you'd expect the only um yeah we, we don't have we don't have a great deal sadly and it is mainly sort of agricultural weeds but we're yeah we keep looking <laughs> There is a question by uh, Marilyn Sally McGrath. They, there are the remains of cattle, wild boar, and perhaps deer, but what were the main domesticates found there? Um, well, Paul Croft, who is our archaeozoologist, has, um, yeah, we've got sheep, goat, we've got pig, we've got deer, we've got cattle, and he thinks even though cattle bones are not the most numerous, they were probably the main meat yield because of their greater size. So it does seem that um, they're still, yeah, certainly relying on hunted animals occasionally, deer, wild boar, but certainly a lot of sheep, goat is the most numerous and cattle was an important source of meat as well. And we've got dogs, we've got a donkey, we've got a dog, we've got um, the odd bird, but primarily sheep, goat. Thank you. May I ask the, the, the figurine of the um, of the bovid that you showed? Mm -hmm. I was watching Anna Spiru's lecture the other day on the Star Sea workshop that she was talking about zebus that yeah. they have in camp. Is this a zebu that you have there? Did she have an opinion on this? I think it's kind of in the wrong spot, the hump on this little guy. But yeah, I mean, we've we've talked about it, but I think, yeah, I don't think he quite works as a zebu, this little one. But yeah, if we can make it so that would be interesting. But I think he's a bit earlier than the other zebu she's got, isn't he? Because they're all late Bronze Ages. And this could be, I mean, I really, I didn't say, but because it's redeposited, it could be as early as the early Cypriot. We don't really know how to date those figurines. Any other questions from the chat or live? I see there's a question there about connections with Crete. I wish, I mean, honestly, if I could find a shirt with a double axe, <laughs> I mean, we ought to. I mean, I'm thinking about it, we're contemporary with Tumbatu Screw, which has the nice Lake Minoan one connections. Um, we're in a similar kind of situation. It would, um, it would be as logical that we should have Cretan connections as they do up in North Sui Bay, but not at this point. Okay, let us ask, could you say more about the late Calcolithic ceramics in Filia tombs? Oh, <laughs> um, well, it's basically certainly one very fine red and black stroke burnished vessel, but it's not Kasanga Mosfilia. And I'm not, uh, I, happy to show you a picture and you can see if maybe it's chloric house, but I don't think it looks so much like your material either, Bleda, but we currently um, can't really pin down which calcolithic site it might be from, but it's a very easy to understand how Dickius could have thought this was just regular red polished because it is a really beautifully made spouted bowl in tomb one. But yeah, um, we can email Bleda and I'm happy to share the photo. Any other questions? No? Well, thank you very much, Lindy, for a wonderful lecture and for sharing with us even the latest uh, of the excavation. Of course, you, we were left hanging for the 2020 excavation for what would have brought in, in this season. Let's mm -hmm. hope uh, that next year you will be uh, able to return to the site and you have even more exciting results. Absolutely. So thank you everybody for being with us. Thank you, Lindy. We have quite a lot of people from all over watching you. Yes, there's, hello everyone. Good to see you. <laughs> so many members of the team here as well. It's really nice, yeah. So thank you. And uh, next Monday we have another lecture. I cannot remember now who the lecture is, but please join us next week as well. Okay? All right. Thank have you a good evening. Thank you, everybody. Okay.
Bye. Bye.